Man, it's Christmas Eve. I mean, can you believe it? It is the day before Christmas. And here's my question for you. Have you captured it? I mean, have you captured that moment? Have you captured that what we would call the spirit of Christmas or that feeling of Christmas? I mean, have you, have you drunk enough cider? Have you drunk enough hot chocolate and coffee? Have you eaten enough cookies? I mean, people are offering me cookies this morning, right before I'm about to preach. I mean, like, it must be Christmas because people are coming up to me with cookies. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, and hear me, I don't need enough, I don't need any more sugar. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, like, there's enough. But have you watched enough movies? Have you had that moment where that roaring fire is going on and that the tree is there and your family surrounding you with just this perfect moment, right? Where they're all well behaved, no one's saying anything bad against one another. Have you had one of those moments, right? It's fleeting. It can't be captured. And have you been looking for it? I'm telling you. I literally woke up this morning. I said, it's Christmas Eve, man. Where, have I not captured that moment yet? Have I not had that moment where it just all just all came together? Because I'm telling you, I've been listening to Christmas music since September. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, I mean, I love it. I've been all over it. You know what I'm saying? Trying to find it, put that tree up early, get all the decorations going on. I'm telling you, I mean, like, but where is it? What happened? And we look for places to blame. It's just too busy. Oh, the weather has just been too warm this year. I just haven't felt that moment. And over and over again, you begin to grasp for something and grasp for something and grasp for something. And you realize that, wait a minute, that's not what this is all about. It's about a savior. It's about a redeemer. Entering into this world to rescue us. And that joy cannot be found. True joy True, total peace that we're talking about cannot be found in the things of this world. It can only be found in the one true living God who has come to rescue us. And the passage that we're gonna take a look at this morning, Matthew chapter two, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there, Matthew chapter two. The passage we're gonna take a look at this morning is not about fuzzy feelings. It is not about that warm little manger scene and the wonderful little proper shepherds coming in. It's not any of those. Angels are not singing in this moment. This is a moment that really fulfills what Pastor Scott preached on last week, where he, that phrase appeared in the passage, he came to reveal our hearts. And in this passage, our hearts are about to be laid open. They're gonna be laid open in people like Herod and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Magi. And we're going to see who we really are before Christ. Because when Jesus shows up, not everybody is happy. Stand with me this morning in the honor of God's word. Matthew chapter two, beginning in verse number one. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, Lord, we humbly come before you and your word. Father, knowing that you came for us, 
And that, Lord, there is no joy apart from you. There's no peace apart from you. Lord Jesus, open up our hearts and our eyes and our minds this morning. How do we stand before you in this moment? Do we know you? Are we surrendered to you? Father, please draw us near. Show us who you are this morning. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. As we go through this passage, there is the one phrase, where is he who is born king of the Jews? And with that phrase, there come three different reactions. Up on the screen up here for you, there's just three reactions this morning. One is that you are either a worshiper or there is hostility towards Christ or there is indifference to him. And as we walk through this passage, you're gonna see three different reactions to Jesus. And the question you have to ask yourself as we begin to dig into God's word this morning is, where do you find yourself? Are you a worshiper of Christ where you've surrendered your life to him? That you are searching him out, that you are seeking to know him and to follow him? Or at the name of Jesus, is there this hostility? Is there this rebellion? Like, I don't want anything to do with you. You have no right upon my life. Or Is there indifference? Man, I grew up in the church. I know the right answers. I can give you the Sunday school answers all day long, but I've not actually surrendered my life to Christ. I'm going through the motions. Another word to capture that would be, I'm lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. So let's dig into the scripture. Let's dig into verse number one. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, who is, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Let's hang here for just a moment. Wise men from the east, the magi, known as other places we know them as the wise men, have been on the hunt, been on the search. A star had appeared to them many, many months ago, and they've been following this star all the way to Jerusalem, knowing that that this star has indicated that a ruler has been born. And so they come naturally where? Into Jerusalem, the capital. They come into the palace. These are one who are kings from the east, so they have access, and they come into the palace, and they announce, where is he? Where is he who's been born king of the Jews so that we may come and worship him? But unfortunately, they've entered into a place who who have no idea that an actual king, the real king, has been born. In fact, there's a king on the throne in Judea who does not and will not tolerate a rival. Unbeknownst to them, they enter into the presence of a guy named Herod. Now, Herod, we know, is a puppet king. He's been placed there by Caesar to do Rome's bidding, but he is king over that territory, and he loves being king. If you read about his history, this guy was ruthless. He killed sons. He killed rivals. He killed one of his own wives. This guy was ruthless. He would do whatever it takes to stay on the throne. And these guys come announcing a true king, a born king, one who's gonna be an actual ruler over the entire nation. And what does the scripture say? Herod was so happy about this. Is that what the scripture says? It says in the scripture that he was troubled. And the word that's given there for troubled is one of anxiety and distress. I mean, overwhelmed. I mean, Herod is mad and overwhelmed and worried and having anxiety. And the scripture says that the rest of Jerusalem was troubled with him and distressed with him. Why? Because they know how ruthless he is. And here comes a journey. Do we really love Jesus? Because I can tell you what we really love in here. We really love being a little Herod. We love being on the throne of our lives. We love to rule. We love to be in control. We love to make decisions. And I'm telling you, if you don't, then you're a liar because you've been cut off this week. Was that a good reaction or a poor reaction? You had to wait in the line this week. How did you do, little Herod? Were you patient? 
How'd you do with that? You know what I'm saying? We all have these Herods in us and we love to be on the throne. And I'm telling you, here comes one who announces that he is the one true king. And I'm telling you, there are many of us in this room, we're troubled by that. We don't want to submit. And take a look at what Herod does. Look at the progression that he goes through. He hears it, he's troubled. What's the first thing he does in verse number four? And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, what's he do? He inquired of them whether Christ was to be born. Herod's not a dummy. Herod, what he does, begins to investigate what this king is really about. Where is he going to be born? He begins to use information for what? For his own selfish purpose. He begins to take information and to manipulate it, use it for his own bidding, trying to use information so that he could gain what? An advantage. And he goes to the scribes and the Pharisees and he receives from them the correct information. Look what he does with the information in verse number seven. Then Herod summoned, this is key, the wise man, what? Secretly. And ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. He wants further information. He wants to not, not just to know location, he wants to know when. And he doesn't do it publicly. He doesn't do it in front of the scribes and the Pharisees. He brings it in secretly. What's he doing? He's putting together info to be able to use for his advantage. And look where far it takes him. Not only is he manipulating, but look what he continues in verse number eight. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and what? Worship him. Liar. Have you ever lied? Have you ever lied to keep your position? Have you ever lied to make yourself look better than you should? Have you ever lied in order to get your way? This is the progression of sin, specifically the sin of pride, to manipulate, to lie. Eventually, where does it take Herod? Murder. That's a scripture we don't like to look at during Christmas time, is it? He was manipulated, he was fooled, God protected, and he became so furious that he went into Bethlehem and killed every firstborn son under the age of two. That's where it takes you, sin always takes you where you never thought you would go. Where is he going? He's on the throne trying to protect himself and it's called pride. C.J. Mahaney writes up here, there's gonna be a list up here for you and there's gonna be a quote. C.J. Mahaney writes, pride is when sinful human beings aspire to the status and position of God and refuse to acknowledge their dependence upon him. Our pride wants to turn ourselves into little mini gods. This list is an indication of whether or not pride is in your life. I was given this list a week and a half ago while I was in a marriage retreat with Allison, and we were given this list, and we were given, I'm gonna read you some definitions of each one of these terms, and as this list was given to us, the instruction was given, you're about to go spend time with your spouse, and you are going to indicate the two areas you struggle with the most. And as I was listening to the list, I'm thinking, man, I got every one of those, you know what I'm saying? I got a problem here, I'm all seven. And I'm like, I've got to pick out two. And that was hard because I realized God was doing what? Revealing my dependency upon myself and not him. See if you join me with this list. Fear. Fear is the pride. Is, is, uh, pride is the root of fear and anxiety. Fear simultaneously reveals our lack of trust and our poisonous self-reliance. We fear because we don't have faith in the Lord. We are enormously preoccupied with ourselves and we don't have control. Number two, entitlement. We, we deceive ourselves into thinking we're better than we are. So we deserve better than we have. We think we deserve God's mercy. We think we deserve people's praise. We think we deserve love, success, comfort, accolades. We certainly don't think we deserve suffering, heartbreak, or discipline. But when we do experience these things, we grow bitter, frustrated, and disturbed because we believe we're entitled to more. We forget that apart from Jesus Christ, we are sinners who deserve condemnation. Number three, ingratitude. Our proud hearts say we are good, that we should get what we want. And if we don't, 
We're justified in our ingratitude. If we're uncomfortable or inconvenienced in any way, we complain. It's our right. Welcome to America. You know what I'm saying? Have you ever had a moment of ingratitude? Have you ever had a moment of entitlement? Man, I guarantee you've had that moment while you've been standing in line. The checkout person's not moving fast enough. How dare you get into a line with only 10 items? You know what I'm saying? What are you doing using the self-service when you have like 50 million items? Have you ever had that moment? What are these people thinking? That's called ingratitude. That's called entitlement. I live with this every day. I don't know about you. You know what I'm saying? Like there's this moments of pride where it shows its ugly head. Number four, people pleasing. Pride is, listen to this, self-worship and self-preservation at all costs. And people pleasing is the direct result of pride. Some people pleasing is a, some think, some think that people pleasing is a positive trait because they're so clearly concerned with serving others. But that belief is nothing more than a sneaky sheepskin we put over our wolfish habit. People pleasing is all about self-satisfaction, fearing man more than God and seeking the fleeting happiness that comes from man's approval. Number five, prayerlessness. Pride deceives us into thinking that we can do life on our own, that we're capable, independent, unstoppable, and self-reliant. We think we don't need God every hour, that we don't need his help, grace, mercy, courage, and hope. So surely we don't need to pray. Have you stopped praying? Number six, hypocrisy. When you're proud, you elevate your status, forgetting the, that the mercy God has shown you. You think you're better and holier than everyone else, and you easily find fault with others. Pride produces a hypocritical spirit. Number seven, rebellion. Rebellion against God manifests itself in reliance in resistance towards the word and the spiritual leaders he has placed in our lives. It is a reflex of a prideful heart. It also shows itself in a lack of submission. Rebellion says, I know better than you, God, when you actually don't. Do any of these capture your heart? Does any of this reveal where you actually stand before a holy God? Because I'm telling you, one of the hard things about scripture is that it points out our weaknesses. It points out our sin and it's sobering and it's a wake up call and you realize that, wait a minute, I don't have it all together. I am broken. I am rebellious. I am hypocritical. I am entitled. I am self-reliant. I am prideful. My life is more captured and filled with fear than it is with peace. And we rebel against the ownership of God. Don't think you're any better than Herod. Because I'm telling you, here comes the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords announcing his rule and his ownership. And we have a tendency to rebel against him. And if you're not in open rebellion, you may be living a life of indifference. Take a look back in the scripture. Take a look at verse number five. Actually, let's go back to verse number four. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he, meaning Herod, inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They, the scribes and the Pharisees, told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Herod needed information. Where did he go? Well, he went to the right place. He went to the scribes and the Pharisees. These guys, they've grown up in church. They have studied God's word. They know the right answers. They gave him the correct answer. They told him very specifically from Micah 5.2, he's gonna be born in Bethlehem because that's the city of David. That's where it's prophesied. That's where it's gonna take place. They gave him the right information, but they didn't do anything about it. They knew all the things about God, but they didn't actually know God. Knowing about him is not the same thing as knowing him in a relationship. And if we're not careful, that information all of a sudden produces this defense mechanism to keep God far away. Several of our young people went throughout our neighborhoods to invite 
people to our Christmas Eve services over this past week. I had some of my family members who went here at Fagenbush, some of my family members were at East Campus, and so we were scouring the neighborhoods. I was amazed when they came back and they told me the exact same answers to some of the same invitations. When they knocked on someone's door, they would give them an invitation. Hey, we're from Highview, we wanna give you an invitation to our Christmas Eve services. Hey, that's okay, I don't need that, because I am fill in the blank, right? Wow, I'm, I'm Catholic, or I, I go to Southeast, or I, you know, you get all kinds of different answers or whatever else. What that was is that's a defense mechanism to say, I don't want to actually hear what you have to say. I'm good. That's what a lukewarm person says. I'm good. I got this. I know the right answers. And in fact, you actually do know the right answers, but you're not actually doing anything with them. You're just like the scribes and Pharisees who gave the right answers. Here comes Herod inquiring about where the, the Christ child, the Messiah, was to be born. They give the right answer, and no one in their head said, hey, do you think we need to go check this out? Do you think that it actually might have happened? Do you think, wait a minute, there's something in me that says, I need to go to Bethlehem. I need to see whether or not this is taking place. No! That's what happens in a lukewarm relationship. That's what happens in this idea of putting God off and being indifferent. You actually... Don't know him. There's only one group in this whole episode that actually experiences joy, that experiences this incredible moment, and it's those who actually wanted to worship Jesus. Take a look, take a look with me with the Magi. Take a look with me in verse number nine. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. These guys have been on a long journey. And the Lord was continuously, this is the key, leading them. That's what I want you guys to know. God is leading us. He doesn't leave us in the dark. He gives us his word. He leads us to him. That's the key. Where is God leading them? To a moment, to an experience? He's leading them to a person. He's leading them to God himself. That's the beauty of the gospel. God is leading us to himself. The answers are found in him. Joy is found in him. Peace is found in him. Forgiveness is found in him. All the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. And they lead, God leads them to himself. And in that moment, there was great joy. They came in with exceeding joy. And what happened? They bowed down before him. They worshiped him. And part of that worship was giving that acknowledged his greatness. And they gave gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh, gifts that are worthy of a king. Gold, you don't need an explanation of that. If somebody gave me gold for Christmas, if you gave me gold for Christmas, you would be awesome. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, like, yes. Thank you, gold. You know what I'm saying? It's still valuable today. Frankincense and myrrh, both incredibly valuable. Frankincense was an incense. Myrrh was like an aloe and they were fragrant and they were incredibly valuable, still valuable today. They gave gifts worthy of his presence. They bowed before him and they worshiped. And God changed their Lives. Take a look at verse number 12. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, what's God is protecting them. They departed to their own country by another way. That's a key phrase right there. That's a phrase we run over real quickly. By another way. What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That another way is Jesus. They departed back to their own country knowing Jesus. They have met the king and now they're living life by another way. 
Does that capture your life? Are you living life by another way? Are you living life according to God's word? Or are you living life according to your authority? Are you living according to his authority? Are you living according to another way? That's what Jesus can do right now in this moment, in an instant. He can change your direction. And many of you want to continue to move in the same dysfunctional, destructive direction, somehow thinking that apple cider is going to make it better. That's not true. God wants to change your direction. He wants to change your way. And he has the power to do it. He has the power to free you. He has the power to change you. He has the power to heal you. He has the power to give you the promise of eternal life. He has the power. Do you trust him? Do you believe in him? Have you surrendered to him? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you're so good to us. You showed up when we needed you the most. And you're calling us. Just as you were leading the Magi, you are leading us to yourself. Lord Jesus, please let us hear your voice. Please give us the courage to come home to you. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, Where do you stand before Jesus right now? Only you know this. Are you a worshiper of Jesus? Or are you hostile to Jesus? You're rebellious towards him. Or are you indifferent? You actually don't even care. And you are drugged into this place and you're ready to get out. But the Lord is knocking on your heart right now. There's something inside of you. There's something right now that's going on. You know that it's about Jesus. You know that it's not about yourself. Lord Jesus, give us the strength right now to come and to lay our lives before you as the Magi did, to lay our lives and our gifts before you and truly believe and worship, knowing that you will change our way. Father, have your way with us this morning. We pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen.